There is only one way in which governments and central banks are going to try to get out of this. By the way, they don't get out of it. They just extend it, which is massive financial repression. They now have to keep printing or we crash. We've got this ticking time bomb. Talking gold with the one and only Andrew McGuire. Welcome to Live from the Vault. Hi there, my name is Shane Moran and I'll be your host for this episode of Live from the Vault and welcome to the show that goes beyond the headlines and uncovers the truth about the precious metals industry and the effects on the global economy in these historic times. We have exclusive access to experts and insiders and we reveal information and insights that you simply won't find anywhere else. Now this week, we have the one and only Andrew McGuire, precious metals expert and whistleblower in the vault and to help him pull back the curtain, We'll be joined by a returning guest and by popular demand by you, the Live from the Vault community, global economics expert, Danielle LaCalle. And that's right, Danielle LaCalle is in the vault and you're not going to want to miss a word of this conversation. But just before we go over and introduce our featured guest and head over to the UK, please help keep spreading the word about this channel by hitting that like button right now. Hit the like button, share this information so more people can find out about this channel and if you haven't already subscribed, you can subscribe right now. And if you if you click on that bell right there, we'll notify you as each episode goes live. And to tell you a little bit about Daniel LaCalle, for those who haven't heard of him, he is a world-renowned ec economist, and he works as a manager, and he's also a professor of global economics. Now, he's the author of several economics books, as, as well as being a columnist and a contributor to various print and digital publications. And with that, let's head over to the UK and talking gold with the one and only Andrew McGuire and our featured guest, Danielle LaCalle. Over to you, Andy. Thanks, Shane, and thanks everybody for joining us. Um, Danielle, thank you so much for joining us today. I've been really looking forward to it. We've had a ton of requests for you. And by goodness me, I cannot believe it. It's actually almost a year since we did our last episode. Absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's always a, a great pleasure and uh, lots to talk about. Yeah, a lot of things have happened in a year. Yeah, and uh, the I, funny thing is, is that um, I think the, exact, the last time, the last episode we recorded was literally um, uh, three or four hours, like it is now, uh, ahead of um, FOMC release, because we're recording this on Wednesday the 18th, and um, and it was about two or three hours before the we expected the FOMC to be hiking rates again yeah. uh, and, and perhaps threatening, um, uh, uh, you know, the rate rights. I think there was a series of rapid rate rate hikes and, and we were concerned about uh, banking contagion and a number of issues. So, uh, well... Where would you like to start, Daniel? Because honestly, we'd like to pick your brain on, on so much stuff. Okay, well, to start with, I think that what we can say is that we have lived the shortest period of policy normalization in the history of inflationary bursts. You know? uh, if you look at the moment from when the Federal Reserve really started to hike rates and reduce the balance sheet to now, when we are likely to see a, a, a significant rate cut and probably subsequent ones, the, uh, is it, this is a, a very shocking uh, way of, of, of seeing how the central banks behave. Everybody knows that an inflationary bust tends to generate a number of ripple effects, including, obviously, uh, shelter is significantly above CPI. Uh, in, in numerous cases, you have headline CPI below core CPI, case of the United States. So uh, the concerning thing right now is that central banks are paying more attention to government bonds and to markets than to uh, combating inflation in their policy. And let's remember, obviously, that the major central banks have completely missed their uh, objective and their mandate, which is uh, stable stable uh, prices uh, for for more than for now more than four years. No. Yeah, and I I, I think you I read something on, on your website, and I would do encourage people to go to your website. Um, a ton of information there. 
Um, obviously, we're going to put a link in there. But you were talking about, and and it was, it, it, I think pe- people need to give the head a shake because I don't think the way you put it is is actually quite clarifying. And you talk about the biggest monetary destruction in the history, yeah. in history, coming your way. Can you can you kind of uh, draw draw a picture around? Okay, everybody that is watching us or listening to us right now uh, must have thought that the period of 2008 to 2020 was a very aggressive period of monetary destruction, of the of massive uh, monetary stimulus, so-called stimulus, etc. However, the the problems that have been building in the economies, particularly in the United States, but also and also in the euro area. Um, and the UK or Japan in these years have led to a completely impossible situation for central banks. The level of fiscal imprudence and the level of of aggressiveness in uh, increase in debt, increase in uh, structural deficits in major economies is unprecedented. Furthermore, particular, particularly in a period of peace, in a period of peace and a period of growth. Uh, but also, very few people tend to talk about unfunded liabilities. Everybody talks about global debt, public debt, debt to GDP, etc. But very few people seem to be aware of the rising unfunded commitments. In the case of the United States, it's about 100% of GDP. But in the case of France, it's about 400% of GDP. In the case of Japan, it's over 500% of GDP. So this means more debt that will be uh, issued in the future and therefore more monetary destruction, as I call it, because a lot of people sort of uh, talk about this, this as support for the economy. This is not support for the economy. This is destruction of the purchase and power of, of the currency, which we have seen in the 2008 to 2020 period and which is likely to be a lot worse from the 2024 uh, fiscal year to 2034. Think about this. The United States Treasury, without considering any recession, without considering any decline in uh, corporate or personal tax revenues, without any negative impacts on employment, is expecting an increase in debt over the period 2024 to 2034 of $16 trillion. Hmm? So that alone is going to be monetized one way or the other. That's why I call it the biggest period of monetary destruction ahead. Forget about what has happened in the past. Forget if you think that uh, gold prices have soared because of the lunacy of the fiscal imprudence of the uh, European or, or, or North American economy. No, 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 no. What's coming is the worst. Wow. I mean, <clears throat> so look, look, I mean, obviously, uh, I think even conservatively, then um, uh, it looks like a trillion is being printed every 90 days. Um, but interest costs for the first time in history topped one trillion dollars. Uh, Daniel, Daniel, I mean, this is this sparks the a question in my mind. Uh, you know, what are what are the risks here of bond market buyers going on strike, um, driving a huge spike in in interest rates? What what happens then to the daisy chain of derivative bets yeah. anchored to these Fed bets that they seem to rely on? Well, I'm, I, a lot of people look at this unsustainable situation and think that the risk is that we're going to see a bust, a huge collapse, an enormous crash. No, unfortunately, it is worse for the average citizen and it's uh, relatively benign for governments because the way that it ends is persistent stagnation. Hmm? If you look at Japan, which has over 200% of GDP debt hmm, and very, very low rates, very low uh, bond yields, um, the Japanese government spends about 25% of its budget in interest expenses. That is what's happening in the United States very, very soon. 
Right now, it's $1 trillion of interest expenses. And people say, oh, don't worry, because the Fed is going to cut rates, therefore interest expenses will come down. It doesn't matter if the average percentage of the interest expense is coming down. What matters is the accumulation of debt. No? Mm -hmm. So even if low rates continue, you're going to get a much worse situation in terms of the budget. Now, what you've said is, is very important. Why? Because uh, the entire financial system relies on the perception that the U.S. Treasury bond, that, that, that the treasuries are the most reliable and safest asset. Mm -hmm. But this starts to show the cracks in the, in, you know, in the structure is that is that the uh, is that it doesn't matter that the Fed eases because interest expenses continue to be way too high. It doesn't matter if the markets continue to rise and buy those bonds because you'll start to get losses you know you will start no you will continue to have losses in real terms in the sovereign bond portfolio ultimately all of this which sounds very technical means that there is a declining confidence in the US dollar as the world reserve currency added to a declining confidence in the euro in the yen in in the pound no what we are seeing what we saw this year the yen falling to 40-year lows relative to the U.S. dollar was a clear indication of that. No, the yen declined dramatically, despite all of those mainstream neo-Keynesian economists saying that Japan had found the magic formula. You can enter into all of the debt that you want, and you will not have any financial problem, and you will have a stable currency uh, because you can keep bond yields under control, you can keep the currency under control, and you can keep the uh, the sort of uh, demand for uh, local bonds uh, relatively stable. And it crumbled. And it crumbled. And that is going to happen to the United States. That is going to happen to the United States. I bet that the Federal Reserve will cut rates and that you will have a short period in which bond yields will stabilize a little bit, not dramatically, and then rise again. So now you've mentioned about um, uh, sort of debt direct debt monetization. Um, is, are we headed to a point where we will see negative interest rates? Absolutely. The euro area already did it. The experiment was implemented in some of the Nordic economies with disastrous effects. Let's, let's remind this. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it was implemented by the euro area uh, with also very negative effects. Remember that the, the euro area had negative nominal rates all through 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, so previous to COVID, previous to any sort of external excuse that, that some economists use. And the euro area closed 2019 with France in contraction, with Italy in stagnation, with Germany close to recession. So nominal rates will be implemented. Uh, th there's only one way in which governments and central banks are going to try to get out of this. By the way, they don't get out of it. They just extend it, which is massive financial repression. So is, is the, I mean, they, I mean, one would imagine, I mean, there must be some shred of a plan somewhere. Obviously, they seem to be ducking and diving. They, I mean, to be honest, if my bank manager looked, was acting like from pillar, running from pillar to post like the Fed seems to be doing, I, I'd probably change banks right away. But I guess we don't have the option of doing that. So are they, are they relying on pushing us into central bank digital currencies where they can literally do what they want, and there's nothing we can do about it. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. The way to get you into digital currencies is not the way that people think. People think that we are going to be forced to, be, to use digital currencies uh, by some kind of imposition. No, uh, they will likely use the next 
uh, bump or the next uh, significant uh, slump in, in, in markets to say, hey, you know, your savings are at risk in your commercial bank. However, here in the central bank, they're going to be super safe and they're going to get a better return. And this is critical. All of the measures used to impose policies that will be detrimental to the purchasing power of the currency and detrimental to, to savers and to real wages have been implemented through a crisis and the uh, promise of uh, great returns, quantitative easing, negative nominal rates, negative real rates, uh, and quantitative and qualitative easing, ETF purchases, all of these things have always been uh, implemented through the the excuse of the extraordinary. No, oh, it's 2020. We need to print you know, 20 trillion dollars. Mm, okay, fair enough. It's extraordinary. No, ah, they already done it. No, so yes, of course. Central bank digital currencies are the plan. It's the only way in which you can uh, uh, unashamedly erode the purchasing power of the currency when needed and implement what central bankers call the uh, efficiency in the transmission mechanism of monetary policy. The efficiency in the me transmission mechanism of monetary policy is basically to get rid of the uh, backstops that make monetary policy if, uh, avoid huge inflationary periods and make it direct no? and make it direct in a way in which uh, central banks can utilize currency in the way that these, they see fit directly into or out of your account. And then, of course, there's the, the what concerns me is is the wider uh, the wider concept of of a, a Chinese like social credit system yeah. being imposed upon us. And and you know we've been we, we saw the example of this COVID situation uh, where there was one narrative. Uh, we now see the one na single narrative of the green policy. Um, I mean, you know, obviously <laughs> there comes a point when. Um, and, and I think this is something that you you've done some work on this is about you've been people are, are discouraged from even being allowed to question any of this in the mainstream media. Daniel, you've done some work on this because thank goodness we have you here today, because if you go on Bloomberg, you go on very left leaning. I, I find Bloomberg very left leaning, but but essentially you go on any of those. Uh, no, nobody. And, and it's. And it worries me when there is one single narrative and you don't get just the questions that we're asking today. Um, it really is concerning that, that somebody, there's a bigger plan at work. Well, I don't think that it's even hidden, is it? No, I think that it's very evident when they talk about disinformation, misinformation and all these things, that there is... Uh, uh, the, the, there is not just a an intention, but also a threat of mm, questioning the official narrative, questioning the official narrative, whatever it is. You see, you, you're getting people in the UK, Spain, the United States, they're talking about uh, mm, getting prison fines for reposting memes, things like that. No? Um, but that is obvious. Think about this. If you are a central bank or a, or a government issuing a currency and you truly believe that your currency is going to be the best and not just the best, but the most valuable and most sought after. And the central bank is going to defend the purchasing power of the currency no matter what, etc., uh, you won't have any problem with free speech or with dissent. Why? Because if maybe, I don't know, somebody somebody crazy goes out and says, oh, this is all a disaster, people will look and say, no, no, it's actually doing pretty well. I'm very, I'm very happy. The reason why they're actually pursuing uh, the uh, self-censorship is what they're looking for. It's not even censorship. Censorship is pretty easy to sort of navigate, as we all know, no, the ones that, we, that are a little bit older, like myself. Um, 
The problem is self-censorship. The problem is that what they're trying to impose is the doubt that you could be punished for thinking differently from the a narrative that has not even been fully uh, developed yet. No, so you better just not do anything. You better just you know bow down and 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 and, and agree. That is the problem. Uh, it's and it's you know the the in, in the financial world at least. There is there is a debate, there is a discussion going on, and I think that it's pretty obvious, and and we we have it. I think that it's more more dangerous when it comes to people. Uh, I think that the, the 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 biggest danger comes when people all over the world have absolutely no clue of what inflation is. Mm. I read the other day somebody saying, oh, I don't know why uh, X or Y uh, politician lost the elections when he was already bringing prices down. No, he wasn't. The reduction of inflation is not the reduction of prices. But you see, you know, there is there is a narrative in which people don't know what inflation is. People don't know that the reason why it is more difficult to purchase a home or to pay the rent uh they just say hey things are more expensive all the time this must be due to the supermarkets this must be due to the evil landlords this must be due <laughs> to everyone except the one that is issuing a currency that is worth less and less every day yeah and it's funny the last time we 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 spoke again a year ago it was when um uh, a friend uh, somebody i i've been in touch with a long time nigel farage um and I've been on his show as a guest. Uh, and essentially, he, it, just at the time I spoke to you, it was the very day, I think, that they fired um, the national, um, uh, the, the, the Nat, Nat West chief um, after he had exposed um, being cancelled, or his bank accounts being cancelled, simply because he had a different view, which is what you're talking about, a different view to the single narrative. Um, and it's not even that he had a, it was, Cash. I mean, they can they use the arguments. Well, if you're a cash taker, it's so cumbersome, and we don't really want your business, and this kind of stuff. Hang on, look, th th this kind of stuff. This what's worrying about that is that banking is 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 like it's like water and electricity. It's a utility you cannot do without. And when they literally cut hundreds of thousands of bank accounts off for Reasons of um, because you're even related to somebody who made a tweet about something. Who? What business is it of any banker to take that on? Yeah, and that is that is very concerning because people see these things as anecdotes. No, oh yeah, yeah. I seem to remember vaguely that this happened. No, um, they don't see it as tests. No. Uh, it's being tested. Uh, how how are how is the public reacting to the uh, unilateral decision of a bank to close down accounts due to uh, opinions? Ah, uh, okay, fair enough. Seems that people are not doing too much, so we may do it in the future. No, um, same with social media. Same with all these things, little by little. No, that are eroding uh, freedom of speech. Uh, freedom to freedom to disagree, and by the way, freedom to say things that are incorrect. What's the problem with that? No, is this concept of oh, you know, there is a very high risk of misinformation and um, and disinformation. Well, if you're worried about disinformation and misinformation, you need more freedom of speech, not less. No. If I, if we in this conversation uh, say uh, a figure or or a statement that is uh, empirically incorrect, I can guarantee you that when we publish it, somebody in the comments will say, "Hey, come on, Daniel, you got this figure wrong." No problem. What's the problem? There's no problem with that. The problem is when it's coming to uh, generate uh, a, a, a unique and single way of thinking, which is not even an ideology because it changes. It's, it's, it's basically, this is, the, this, is, this is the narrative today. You have to say, okay, and maybe two days later they will change it, 
but you will have to say okay as well. No, it's it's much worse. It's much worse actually than censorship. Well, I guess really one of the. I mean, <clears throat> this really ta- what we're talking about here. What it what everything I'm hearing says. You know what? There's certain things that um, it's difficult to fight, but we Daniel, we have the ability to take responsibility for ourselves, which is I think c- critical. And in front of us, what are our options? Well, we we have uh, physical investments in gold, in silver. Uh, perhaps you've got uh, ideas of uh, commodities in general. But we have the ability to actually act. And, and I think this is what's so critical about what our conversation here. Yeah. Is it, it's very concerning. And it, it tells us that we're just small fish in this massive um, uh, cauldron of, uh, of, uh, and I don't even know if they have a real plan. No, no, I'm not. I'm not saying it as a as a conspiracy theory. I'm just saying yeah. what is actually stated by different governments and different politicians uh, in different countries. That it's, I'm not even nothing that I have said is even remotely. Oh, the imagination of Daniel. You've all seen it. It's happening. It's happened. It is happening and happened in Canada. It happened in the Euro area. You just had a uh, uh, European uh, Commission uh, commissar uh, writing to Elon Musk, uh, warning about what they might say in a conversation between a candidate for the elections and himself. Uh, no, these things are, are happening. But there, But you said something that's very important. Is Okay, fair enough. Here comes Daniel and Andrew with the with the doom news. Okay, what can we do? A lot. Hmm? And this is the positive. The positive is the following: the reason why governments and the reason why monetary authorities are becoming increasingly authoritarian and increasingly interventionist is because they are seeing that their power is diminishing and dissolving by the day by a technology, by uh, uh, the different uh, independent opportunities that you may have to safeguard your investments and to keep uh, yourself, let's say, separated from the monetary and fiscal destruction. So this is, this is the positive. The positive is that what we are seeing is a reaction, an evident and, and a defensive reaction to the fact that technology, even with all of those in interests that we have mentioned, mm-hmm. it makes it virtually impossible to implement the kind of, of censorship and of which 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 is a, a first step before full and complete financial repression. So you have technology, you have ways of independent. Uh, of in, investing independently out of that system, you can protect yourself, as you mentioned very well, gold, silver, uh, tried and tested real ways of uh, preserving the value of savings. And you can also uh, protect yourself via technology from the sort of uh, mainstream system. Absolutely, and you mentioned you mentioned the uh, the attempt by the eurozone to put a gag on um, on, on Elon Musk, and and what was interesting is he the good thing about Elon Musk he publishes all of, all of the um, uh, all, all the letters, and in there what they tried to say was look if you do it quietly and don't tell anyone yeah um, uh, we'll just you just moderate it and we no one will know. And he said, well, he said, and in fact, I think he's at this point there, he said, and when he published it, it must have been very embarrassing. Um, uh, but for everyone who wasn't on X, because it certainly didn't appear on any other news channel. Yes, um, it is. It is. But it's also bad for business. And I think that that's, uh, that's also one way that will you can protect yourself, no? Is that... Adhering to the requests of uh, the the governments that want to impose some kind of censorship or silent censorship is bad business. Hmm? And therefore, uh, ultimately, 
these are corporations that are looking for profits and they are looking to generate a positive return. So uh, I'm 100% sure. I don't even doubt it. It doesn't even matter, by the way, if, if they don't do it. The great thing about technology is that there are no barriers to entry. So what Elon Musk has uh, identified correctly, because he's a very smart guy, is that freedom of speech and independence from governments is critical to continue to uh, have X as, a, as the leading platform for people to inform themselves. The moment that you don't do it, two things happen. One, it's bad for business and therefore you should change. But if you don't change, the great thing about technology is that there are no barriers to entry, is that it's very easy to create an alternative to Facebook, an alternative to X, an alternative to Telegram, whatever it is. Uh, and it may take months, it may take days, probably days considering the technology development, no? But it, but it happens, no? Uh, we, Google is not a global leader because uh, it has been imposed, but because it's a people's choice. So the great thing about technology, the great thing about the great thing about monetary independence, the great thing about technology, the great thing about financial independence, the great thing about uh, uh, open systems is precisely the vulnerability that uh, that businesses or that companies have if they don't follow the best interests of the customers. Hmm? That is a great thing. So, uh, so what I envision is that for each of these steps that we remember or that we talk about, in which governments are trying like, like mad to grasp to the last uh, possibilities of, of, of control, there will be 10, 15, 20 options uh, that, that, will, that will look and see that that is a good business and technological development. I think another, sometimes <clears throat> I look, I look for hope amongst all of these things. And, and um, I think one of the things that, that interests me enormously is the, um, the, 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 the sort of transition from the unipolar um, approach, which is US dollar based unipolar approach to everything, um, to a multipolar world. Where, where I see, uh, and of course, it's not all swings and roundabouts. It's not all roses, but we are seeing um, a general, a general um, conception that um, it's better to actually repair, take down the barriers, uh, and get on. Even if you've been traditional enemies, to take down the barriers, get on, and uh, and work together. Um, and if you and, and if we're looking at the BRICS countries, for example, and all those that want to join, et cetera, then we're looking at, I mean, they consume a massive percentage. They either produce or consume a massive percentage of world commodities. And so why would they really need to trade the dollar when they've got alternative currencies to or ongoing alternative currencies which are coming and will not be able to be stopped? So. This is gives me hope, uh, Daniel. Absolutely, absolutely. the The best thing in the world is competition, and the last thing that you want is is a monopoly, and the worst thing is a monetary monopoly. No, um, so two things can happen there. No, one is that the Federal Reserve and the United States government pay no attention to any of these signals and think that these are stupidities uh, that people like us talk about. Uh, and two is that they do pay attention. Regardless, it's a positive for everyone because if they don't pay attention, if you know the history of money as well as I do and the history and history in general, anyone that understands history knows that all empires crumble. Uh, due to a monetary debasement and monetary destruction process. Mm -hmm. the, the Roman Empire stopped being, the, the, it started its decadence with monetary uh, destruction and, and finished it with, with, obviously with an invasion, but it was already dead. So 
the point that I'm trying to make is that if the U.S. government the U.S. government can pay it. The U.S. government less so. I don't care about the U.S. government. I'm going to think about the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is the only central bank in the world that pays attention to the global demand for its currency. The only one. Hmm? The European Central Bank doesn't even know how to calculate global demand for euros. Huh? The Federal Reserve does pay attention to it. Uh, they can choose not to pay attention to it and then lead the world to a to a slow but inevitable de-dollarization that would end up destroying the ability to finance its debt of the of the US government. Or they can pay attention to it. If they do pay attention to it and keep the dollar as the fiat reserve currency, it's a good thing for everybody because the people will continue to prefer the US dollar to the euro or to uh, other currencies. And if they don't, it'll be a slow process, as you've mentioned. There will be some, some, some important elements of negative impact in that process. But it will be an inevitable and ultimately positive way of entering into independent currencies, uh, real alternatives, competition between currencies. There's a small book behind me here. By, by Frederick von Hayek that talks about it, uh, choice in currency as a, way of, uh, uh, as a way of combating inflation, no? Um, so, uh, so that's why I'm positive, you see, is that if they don't do it, it'll happen. And if they, and if they pay attention, then they will have to strengthen the purchasing power, or at least the confidence in the in the in the currency. And now that we're talking today, on the day of the rate cut of the Federal Reserve, it seems that they have listened to us a little bit, because they will only cut by 25 basis points, despite an overwhelming majority of those market participants that you were mentioning before, that were demanding at any cost. Of 50 basis points and four base, and, and four rate cuts into December, that shows that they at least have an ear uh, uh, close to our channel <laughs> and our discussions. That's interesting. That I, I must say that exactly how I was looking at it as well. And uh, you know, the markets always get ahead of themselves here. And and I guess really, if you're you know. Look, if you're if you're a fund manager and or if you're um, trading the markets, and and you realise that you uh, that all your competitors uh, have only one direction, it, it must be you must be on board because the one person that doesn't that that misses the the next move gets fired. So it's basically they're really they're they're, they're just basically all getting on board the same thing. But a lot of these money managers haven't haven't been even they weren't even they weren't even out of school when yeah. 2008 occurred and and they have no concept of of what could happen what the fallout that could happen oh no not at all not at all the we have now two generations of market participants and traders that have seen nothing but monetary easing nothing else hmm? that's why markets when all this, all the surveys of rate cuts and all the surveys of uh, uh, quantitative easing likelihood, etc., are so aggressive because they, a lot of these, a lot of good colleagues I speak with them all day. They say, "Come on, I mean, it's impossible. They need to cut rates faster and they need to ease because that is the only thing that they have seen." Hmm? That's why. Hmm, it is so important for people like you and us to to rem remind of the message that when the confidence in the currency goes away, it goes away fast. It doesn't happen gradually. It doesn't give you the 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 option to prepare yourself. It happens very very quickly. And and one of the questions that uh, I get <clears throat> from the people, okay, yeah. I've got a little gold, I've got a little silver, um, but I've got most of my money sitting in money market funds. And I say, but but hang on, do you, are, you, are you 
Are you not aware that there's a potential for your funds to be gated, um, uh, for uh, a, b- a bail-in to occur? Um, and they said, what are you talking about? Yeah. Well, they weren't even around when they when Cyprus did it. They weren't even around when, and it, it, it boggles my mind. It's viewed as an anecdote. It's viewed as an anecdote. It's not going to happen to us. Hmm? Yeah. I, I was in the UK in 2008 uh, when uh, all of the challenges of the of the local regional banks, etc. And I remember we lived in, uh, in in Wimbledon at the time, and I remember going to uh, the to to Kingston to the to the the, the main the main uh, high street in Kingston and seeing queues outside. Of the savings banks of people trying to get their their money out. No, everybody's forgotten about that. You know, it's yeah. easy to forget about those things. But you need to be aware of the risks that you incur when you ignore the uh, the monetary risks and the and the fa- and the fiscal risks. No, hmm? you just the concept of bail in hmm, is not even discussed these days anywhere when talking about the challenges of the banking sector and the hundreds of billions of non-performing loans and uh, that that have to be in some way um, digested or provisioned, however, no? And I think, you know, if we look around, uh, bail-ins are already evident and I mean, I have a lot of Swiss clients, and I'm sure you have a lot of Swiss clients. And and but if you try and withdraw more than unless you've got a really good lawyer, unless you're really well connected, you try and withdraw more than two or three hundred thousand Swiss francs out of the bank, you are running into major questions. And that includes a client of mine who had 500 kilos of gold sitting in, and we said, go get it, go get it, vault it separately outside the system. They refused to give him his money. In fact, then they produced a a, a document that had no serial numbers on it. When he deposited that gold, they all had serial numbers. Then I think it was in 2002, um, they did some sort of change where uh, allocated bars became unallocated bars. And it was like- Interesting. Unbelievable. Uh, Daniel, I, I couldn't believe it. And so- Unless you're well connected, bail-ins are there. Of because course, if I want to go and take my money out for I want to do something crazy with it, it's up to me. But they refuse to let you take it. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I, I, I obviously, but I think that uh, again, that's why it's important to maintain a certain level of independent information and to try to avoid the consensus messages. Because, well, to start with, because if you just move with consensus, you're not going to make any money and you're not going to protect your wealth. And because uh, it's always good to re- remind yourself of the risks that are embedded in, in financial markets and in the current environment and the banking system. Well, Daniel, I think... I think this is the being, this is this is the kind of stuff, I love this kind of stuff because we, we 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 are talking about stuff which isn't out there on the mainstream media and a lot of, we have a lot of people we touch a lot of people here and and I think you know mo- a lot of our guys are yeah we we're big gold and silver guys or, we, you know, and that's that's not a problem but I think what what we I'm, I'm guess I'm going to ask basically looking at some of the stuff you've talked about here is very concerning, um, but what you know, there are we have the ability to take this responsibility for ourselves. We have certain things we can do today, today, without not waiting for tomorrow, not waiting for who is it fifty basis point, twenty five basis point. Any of that stuff is is irrelevant to the bigger picture. Um, so, what would you suggest? And and obviously, what would you suggest to someone who said to you, "But but Daniel." What do you suggest that I probably do now? I've got money. In, I've got money in the banks, and what should I leave it in the bank, for example? Well, obviously, the you know diversification is key. So don't keep it in the bank. Keep it in banks, huh? hmm? different banks. Okay. Remember what we have just mentioned right now. The second thing is when you have money in banks, 
it, the the best protection is to have it invested hmm? against the bail-in, etc. All the, that is to have it invested, which is outside of the realm of the of any possibility of being being confiscated. And you have to be invested, understanding all the things that we have mentioned. No. Um, Monetary destruction. Yes, uh, you don't have to be invested. Therefore, you have to try to avoid um, sovereign bonds. Hmm? Sovereign bonds are not going to give you a real return because governments are going to impose financial repression and those sovereign bonds are not going to give you returns in real terms and they're certainly if possible not even give you in nominal terms if currency debasement continues. Then, depending on your on your access and your uh, tolerance for volatility, you have to be invested in uh, those equities and those uh, element and those and those financial assets in which there is a higher level of um, uh, link between minority shareholders and management. No. So you need to go to you need to invest in equities in companies where the CEO, the CFO, the people that are managing the company are as worried about the share price as you are. You know? And those that are most benefited from monetary destruction. OK, disruptive technologies, et cetera, et cetera. That's on the equity side and on the bond side. And then I always say people need to think of the portfolio that they own of investments as a living entity or as a or as a football team you need to have a goalkeeper you need to have a goalkeeper and you need to have defense and that's where you need to have gold you need to have physical gold and you need to have and you need to have protection in uh, uh in precious metals precious metals give you the low correlation and the improvement uh, relative to the monetary base uh, that that one wants in challenging times in which you have choppy markets on the equity side. No? So basically, I always say that the 60-40 portfolio is dead hmm? because no government is going to give you money. Hmm? There, and at the same time, what you have is a, a, a an enormous amount of uh, equities that benefit from the destruction of money that we have been discussing. $20.6 trillion in, in, printed in the economy means that in nominal terms, a lot of those companies are going to go to be $100 billion, $200 billion, $300 billion companies. Those are the ones in which you need to, to invest. So basically, equities, gold and, 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 and uh, precious metals, a combination of some commodities, but not too many commodities. Commodities don't work in a in a in a stagnation environment, and um, and try to avoid uh, sovereign bonds. That's what I would say. That, that's that is that is sage advice. And and again, that this is coming from you know you you as an algorithm, you you, you see all the pictures. And I think I think it's important um, because many of us are focused on very on one thing or another. I think you bring to the table this much wider view, which is very important. So we want to know where these pieces fit in, in the big picture. And that's really helpful. Yeah. But I think when you mention uh, in, in investment of wealth protection of gold and silver, of course, you mean physical gold, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You need to have physical yeah. gold. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, ultimately, owning ETFs is another financial instrument, no? So you are equally subject to all of the challenges that come with paper investments so when you so knowing that you that that in a portfolio you're going to have paper investment you're going to have electronic investments and equity so things like that the 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 uh the gold part the the precious metal part is as as much as possible on physical in physical terms yes and if you're going to keep it then obviously independently vaulted uh, out of the banking system. Oh, completely, 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 completely. Remember that, remember, uh, gold has a, tr has a, a history of uh, solvency as money. We know that gold is money and that in any 
cataclysm, in any challenge, in any crisis, you can use gold for anything, while everything else you can debate. Hmm? Gold, silver are our, our money, while the rest is credit, as JP Morgan used to say. Uh, but you also have to remember that Franklin Delano Roosevelt confiscated the gold. Hmm? So you, you need to have your gold outside of the banking system where the government, when it wants, doesn't go out and say, oh, and by the way, I like that. Give it to me. Well, I think this sort of really brings this where we started, which was uh, you, the, the, you talked about the biggest monetary destruction uh, in history is coming our way. Now we're talking about solutions. We're talking about things we can do today based upon um, and really that algorithm that's in your your mind. Uh, and you've mentioned some stuff there, which I think I honestly suggest people play it back twice um, because there's some really, really, really important information in there. And I think we have... One last question, Danielle, if I may. Um, silver. We have so many silver investors. And and I think one of the things that strikes me is if all hell, I'm not saying all hell is going to break loose, but but if there's a if this thing really, really does fall out. Um, <clears throat> and I would like to know, and, and if I'm out of the banking system, I'm forced out of the banking system for some reason. Um, this this brings me back to a, cl a client of ours who is vaulting individually in, in, in vaulting with us um, in, in, in a silo vault. So it's completely out of the system. But it, 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 instead of buying um, thousand ounce bars, he's bought floor to ceiling on pallets, one ounce silver coins. And, and I questioned him on it one day and I said, well, well, why would you pay the extra? He said, you don't understand. He said, I can take each one of those silver coins and I can trade it for anything I want. And, it, and it, so, in other words, at the point that it all collapses, I don't know what would an ounce of coal, silver be worth. It'll be worth what it can buy you, I guess. I think that that is what you just said is something exceedingly important, is that I'm not talking about a disaster. Remember what I'm talking about is stagnation. But if there was a disaster, if there was a real collapse of the, of the monetary and banking system, hmm? Think about this. What do you want to have? Do you want to have a lot of gold coins or a huge mm, bar of gold? Huh? You want the coins. Mm? You want the coins, coins to trade them for stuff, for stuff that you may need. Huh? With a big bar, you're not going to be able to do a lot. Okay. Mm? The point is, that your client is making is 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 very true is if if i want to find some way of protecting myself against uh, a possible debacle hmm, i want to be focusing the way in which i invest for a possible debacle huh? in which i will need to use some form of liquidity which in this case is breaking it down in coins huh, in order to to, to purchase things. Mm -hmm. um, there's also the element of uh, the, the element of security. Now it's easier to take a few, purchase some things, and then keep them somewhere else, etc. Rather than walking around the neighborhood with an enormous with an enormous bar of gold. Um, but I'm not talking about I am not talking about a collapse like that. There will not be a collapse like that in my view. Mm -hmm. It will be stagnation. It will be Japanese style stagnation. Okay. Which means uh, the slow roast process of impoverishment. Uh, and that's the way in which sovereign bubbles burst, which is the problem. The problem is a sovereign, sovereign bubble. No? Mm -hmm. uh, bubbles in the private sector burst and they create, and you, and there are ripple effects, financial crisis, you name it. Sovereign bubbles don't burst like that. Why? In the balance sheet of a bank, in the asset side, the sovereign debt, the sovereign uh, lending requires no capital. Mm -hmm. Therefore, no bank is going to go bust because of the, the, the debasement of the value of the currency. What is going to happen is that that balance sheet 
is going to erode hmm, in the side of the deposits, which in the bank's balance sheet are in the liability side. Hmm? So it's basically basically a quid pro quo huh, in which the deposit side and the uh, and the reserve side are going to be shrunk gradually, while the sovereign uh, side of the asset base uh, also shrinks. And that's so well put. I mean that that is that can that kind of condenses it into a very um, in a very understandable way of of looking at that, and and much and very realistic. And I think. Essentially, at least we've talked about we talked about problems. We talked about potential solutions. We talked about um, anything that may may or may not happen, but more likely what will happen, which is I think very very important to keep our heads on here. Um, but I think you know at least we know gold and silver, um, which is something that obviously we focus so much on. The amount of the amount of money they keep printing will simply make it cost more of those fiat digits to buy the same piece of gold, the same piece of silver. It, it, in fact, you know, this, head, this set of headphones will just cost more because it's cost more. Uh, they've printed more dollars, pounds for me to buy another one. So it, it is a no-brainer to me that at least we know that gold and silver are fungible, globally fungible, understand understand anyone around the world will understand what they are and always have a value for them which is the same value all over the world absolutely when people say that uh, that gold and silver have no intrinsic value uh, they're actually lying no what <laughs> what has no intrinsic value is paper money hmm? daniel i i i you know what we, we I, i'm i'm you know, I, I I would love to keep going here, but but people start getting fed up after an hour. So, <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much. And and would it be possible for perhaps to have you come back? Uh, I don't want to wait another year for this. So can you? We can we possibly have another time, maybe in a couple of months, to come circle back as we get into the end of the fourth quarter, and and see where we are after all of this toing and froing and. Perhaps we can have a good idea of what you think you know, 2025 is likely to look at in retrospect to what we see in the next couple of months. Absolutely. Count on me. It's always a pleasure. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And it's, it's always a great pleasure to be here. Daniel, thank you so much. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Andrew McGuire and Danielle Lacal for another fascinating discussion. And remember to our entire Life in the Vault community, buy physical, buy physical and make sure it's backed one to one and understand the difference between what Andy calls the casino paper, gold and silver markets and the actual physical gold and silver markets. They're not the same. Don't be fooled. So there you have it. That's all we have for you today on another episode of Live from the Vault. Please help keep spreading the word about this channel by hitting that like button if you haven't already done so. And share this information so more people can find this community. And if you haven't already subscribed, hit the subscribe link. And if you click on that bell right there, we'll notify you as each episode goes live. And with that, we'll see you next time right here on Live from the Vault. See you then.